Britain hasn't just been made by generals and politicians and courtiers, but by a whole host of ordinary people, young and old, dedicated to doing the real spade work. This time... Risking your neck to maintain the heart of rural life. Shifting poo to produce enduring images of the countryside. And saving souls in the village by eating bread off a corpse. Welcome to the worst rural jobs in history. Britain's an urban nation. 90% of the population lives in towns. We think of the countryside as a place of tranquility, a nostalgic scene of villages and fields, somewhere to escape and relax. But for most of our history, living in the country has meant the toughest of lives for hosts of anonymous workers. the ultimate pastoral scene. In medieval times, sheep outnumbered the population ten to one. They were a vital source of meat and clothing. The wool trade supported the economy, and it all relied on shepherds, who were as common then as checkout girls are today. The shepherds' 24-7 job was toughest in the Middle Ages. They had to follow their flocks, lugging heavy hurdles and tools for miles to pen sheep that needed treatment. They were lonely, out in all weathers, roughing it in temporary shelters. Shepherds had to do everything for their valuable charges, even dagging, the equivalent of wiping a sheep's bottom. We're supposed to be doing this piece of camera with David but I've got this sheep here that's trying to back off all the time so I've got my knee firmly up its bottom and <laughs> these little cows have wandered into shot. What are we doing? We're, we're going to dag them. What does that mean? That means taking the wet dirty feces off the back. Yeah, where I've got my knee in that's fact. Right. Yeah, it's kind <laughs> enough on a shift, stay there. And the reason we do it yeah. is that if we leave it flies lay their eggs, particularly the green bottle, which is smaller than the big blue bottle, yeah. and the eggs will hatch out into hundreds of maggots which will eat into the skin. And right. it can happen very, very quickly, within a matter of a day. You didn't so realise I'm about to do a favour though, did <laughs> <No>. you? <laughs> oh, right, well, how do we do this? These look pretty fearsome. Very early scissors. <laughs> so what do I do with these? Right. If you move, you're going to get this up your bottom, you know that. Right. Right. Oh, yeah, we just, just cut the wool. Now, I'm not going to cut into anything no. that belongs to the sheep by mistake, am I? As long as it's careful. So worried about cutting the flesh. Oh, no, hang on, there is a bit here. That's it, that's oh, I know what that, that is. Yeah. Right. Ready? That's it. That's it. And, then clip all this and off. if and acting as human toilet paper weren't bad enough, you, shepherds them, had an even more revolting job to perform on young yeah. male lambs. Another job shepherds had to do was to castrate um, male lambs. How did they do that? The shepherd used to cut the end of the scrotum yeah. off with a sharp knife, yeah. squeeze the testicles out, and draw them out with his mouth. You're so, joking. Holding them with his teeth. It was the best way to do it. I'm not going to have to do that, am I? <laughs> because to try and do it with your fingers, they'd slip out. Yeah. And also, your fingers would be dirty. Yeah. But the mouth was the cleanest part and also had some antiseptic effect from the saliva. You'd draw them out and then uh, they would often put a mixture of tansy and butter smeared on the wound to stop the flies getting to it. Oh, I've had a kebab like that before, <laughs> One of the few times shepherds got human company was when the sheep came to be washed in the nearest stream. Why do we have to wash the wool? Why don't we just sell it dirty? Clean wool is worth about 30% more than dirty wool. Although the downside is dirty wool weighs more. 
How many days a week were the shepherds working? Oh, seven days a week. They, uh, they, they had very few days off. <coughs> so that meant no. they couldn't even go to church? No, and that bothered them. So when they were buried, they always asked for a lock of wool to be put in their coffin to prove no. to God that they were a shepherd. Again, but then it hey. <laughs> I'll tell you what, maybe June was not nice nippy. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine. What? <laughs> Bayek is cold. Now, what are we going to do with these here sheep then? We're going to wash the sheep. They'll be let into the river. Yeah. And we'll scrub them with our hands. Yeah. And that will help get them clean and then let them out the other way. Oh, you've gone below your waders, haven't you? <laughs> oh, I'm so pleased. <laughs> a brief splash on a hot day is quite refreshing, but after 20 well, minutes, the it? cold what, what, begins to what, what, seep like into this? the bones. The shepherds had to stick at this for 12 hours, and there was no change of clothes at the end of the day. Oh, please! Oh, oh it's the one that come in, isn't it? Oi, come on, darling. Here you come. Nice, good one. That's it, that's it. Oh. That's it. Oh. <laughs> and I'm not sure if it's any cleaner than it was. <laughs> Back out! It's on the back! Oh. So the, uh, the poor old shepherd never even got to heaven unless he got a bit of wool to wave at the pearly gates. But at least he was never mistaken for the devil. Being taken for Lucifer was just one downside in another worse job from the wool trade. Sheep were marked with iron ore dye sold by the Reddle Man, the unluckiest sales rep ever. I am a Reddle Man. I sell red, and I look red, and I am red. For centuries, the Reddle Man wandered from village to village selling his wares, and his face and his body and his clothes were permanently stained red. And every time he turned up at a different village, the children would run away because they thought he was the devil. How do we know? because Thomas Hardy recorded his humiliating fate in his novel, Return of the Native. 1900s. Like his van, he was completely red. He was not temporarily overlaid with the colour, it permeated him. Shepherds and Reddle men had a really tough time, and all that to keep the nation in socks, but that was nothing compared to putting roofs over their heads. Today, thatched cottages are part of Heritage Britain, the very symbol of rural life. But when they were built, these were poor workers' hovels. Thatched with the cheapest materials, reed or sedge. Harvesting all that thatch was tough regardless, but in the Cambridgeshire Fens, getting a roof was positively dangerous. The fens are full of this stuff. It's a, a kind of a reed and it's called sedge. It's very difficult to get through. And people have been harvesting it for centuries uh, in order to use it for thatch and animal fodder and even for stuffing their mattresses with. Although, quite honestly, I wouldn't like to sleep in this stuff because if you catch it the wrong way, it's razor sharp. It's only a reed, Kev. Why is it so sharp? Well, it's actually a sedge, Tony. They're not just leaves, they're actually a saw sedge. And if you take a look along the edges of the blades there, you can see this serrated edge running all the way down the length of the blade there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you go like this, there's no problem at all, yeah. is there? Yeah. Come back the other way, it's extraordinary. You get snagged by these tiny, tiny little blades. So how did they manage to harvest it? Well, up until the 1950s, we used to use hand tools like scythes and sickles, yeah. and would move along the row, cut in the material, and tie them up into bunches. But you still smash here. your arms, wouldn't you? Sure, we used to have 
bindings running up our entire length of our hands and around our arms. I then used leather or string to bind them onto their arms and that offered some protection against some of these barbed edges that we've got on here. Right, let's get bound up. Okay. Can you give me a hand? Here we are, yeah. So, if you just hold your arm out there. It would have been all the way down to the arm there. And over. The material they use, it would have been the thicker the better, really. It may be quite uncomfortable, but it offered that bit more protection. Do we know anything about the injuries that people actually sustained? From harvesting the sedge, only really what we know of the injuries that we sustain while we're doing it today. Which are what? Deep lacerations, down to the bone in some cases, uh, on the legs, on the arms, on the face, and particularly around the tops of the legs as you're tying the bundles. So it can be incredibly painful. And then, of course, you've got the, uh, the problem that you're using sharp tools, sides and stuff. Exactly. Sedge is cut in midsummer. Working wrapped up in full sun caused heat stroke. And there was also the dreaded fen ague, malaria from mosquitoes in the marsh. Workers eased the shivers with comfort, which was opium. Villages were allotted an area of fen to cut, but it's a wonder anyone took up the option. Were there professional sedge cutters or did everybody do it? No, it was a whole family affair. The adults would use the sides, the women would collect the sedge up and the children would tie the bundles. So you're doing it on top of everything else you did? On top of everything else that you had to do. And uh, they would use the material for thatching yes. or they would sell it on to earn some money to buy some food for themselves. There we go. Right. Does it matter that this is uh, a right-handed side, not <laughs> left-handed? Well, traditionally it would have been a right-handed tool. If you were left-handed, you would have just had to have got on with it as a right-handed tool. So, so sweeping, sweeping in like this, That's yeah? it. Am I doing this right? That's perfect. That's perfect. It was a very long, laborious job. Sedge was cut here well into the 20th century, but it's a really ancient, worst job. A Saxon poem says, Sedge groweth in water, woundeth grimly, drawing blood from any man that maketh any grasp at it. <laughs> I thought I'd chopped it all away. <laughs> Half of it's still hanging on. And it cuts. Sedge stake. I thought it was just a stick in the oh, ground. Oh no, it's a special, <laughs> special stick. <laughs> and uh, pull the string around. Yeah. yeah. And we feed one end through the loop. And now we start to tie. You've got to get them tight because as they dry out, the water evaporates. If they're not tight enough, it all falls out. Yeah. Bearing in mind you've got the sun beating down on you. Yeah. <laughs> one down, a thousand to go. <sighs> But if cutting every inch of a thatched roof by hand was bad, there was worse to come. The Industrial Revolution saw a huge population explosion. The country needed vast quantities of Britain's staple food, bread. So landowners looked to technology for new ways of harvesting and processing the goods that made it. When you buy a new machine to do a job for you, you think, oh great, that's going to make my life easier, don't you? Well, that's not always the case for everybody concerned. Take threshing, which is separating the wheat from the chaff, which is traditionally done by guys whacking at it with flails. And then the farmers started buying threshing machines, and sure, it made their lives easier, the job got done quicker, and they made more profits. But as far as the actual threshers were concerned, Half of them were immediately made redundant and the other half were faced with a whole new bunch of really bad jobs. The corn was harvested in the autumn, then kept in barns until the winter for threshing. So although we've got a perfect day today, men feeding the machines then would have worked in freezing conditions with a machine that could kill the plane. And there's another because while the corn is in the barn, 
it's home to all sorts of birds. Am I dressed okay? Yes, you're not too bad, but I think you ought to have your yoks, as we say in Lincolnshire. What are yoks? These are bits of binder twine that you tie around the bottom of your trouser leg. Why? To stop the rats and mice running up them. They really did? That wasn't just a myth? No, 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 they really did have to do it. Who were the people who did this? Well, they were mostly farm labourers, but it was a very busy time, so it would be a question of all hands on deck. Most of the threshing was done by contractors, so the farmer would ring up the contractor and say, can you come and thresh my stack next week? He would bring the machinery. The engine driver was a specialist, so he'd come with the machine, but the farmer himself would provide the rest of the labour. So everybody would get involved, the farmer himself, the farm workers, children off school, and indeed the farmer's wife. They'd all be called in to help with this very busy time of year. Right, here I go then. Right, Ron, how do I do it? Hello. Put the fork near the string. Yeah. Pick it up, move it over and just flick it like that. Okay, so there, there's one for you. So which end of that's got to be facing him? The ears facing the engine. It didn't really flick it, did I? No. Show me how you... You'll stab his hand if you're not careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. so like this. Oh, that was a good one. So if you'd like to have a go. All right. That's a bit heavier, that one, so. Oh, thanks, mate. Right, put it in near the string. That's right. Lift it up. Oh, it is heavy, isn't it? Yeah, go on. <laughs> that was useless. That was so bad. That's a rotten sheet. No, no, look no, Look at the state no, of that no, sheet. It's a good one, look. What? Easy. All right, stand by to be impressed. Walk in the middle. Labourers were traditionally given up to six pints of beer a day. When you look at the business end of the pressure, it's a wonder they didn't all end up in the mints. Here we go! Oh, God! It nearly fell off! Right! What you have to do is get these sheaves in. Yeah. Get your knife under there, pick them up. Yeah. Keep hold of the knot. Press them. Press them in. Keep hold of the strings. Because at the end of the day, they used to count the strings. Yeah. And so you know how much went you through. Got to... Plus, I use the strings to tie the sacks up down the bottom of that. And my legs. And your legs, yeah. of course. Usually it was the job of the young lad, the, 
the newest recruit to go into the chapel and keep the bottom of the drum clear of the chaff and then it would be bagged up and used for chicken feed probably. Yeah. You have to watch this bit, don't you? Yeah, you have to watch your head. That's it. If you're a little kid and you lost your concentration... Well, it was well. usually the youngest lad who was given this job, or the oldest chap who couldn't get up on the drum anymore. this job, do we? Imagine doing that from dawn till dusk. Yeah, I've imagined it. Off we go. <laughs> but after the threshing is one last horrible job. Before the forklift truck, the corn carrier had to lug 16 stone bags of grain up a ladder to keep it out of reach of rats. And that's the way it goes. Hey. As the country's changed, so have the jobs. Today you'll seldom see a mole catcher with his willow trap and rows of moles hung up on fences to show he's done his work. We've dumped the mad prehistoric job of harvesting stinging nettles. Oh, Henry! <laughs> <laughs> oh, what can I say on time? <laughs> it was just too painful a way to get string and fibre for clothing. And the fen diggers with their beckets and slubbing spades put themselves out of a job as soon as they drained the Cambridge marshes. And gone too is perhaps the strangest worst job ever. Sin eating started in the superstitious Middle Ages, but was still recorded in the Rhondda Valley in 1881. We sometimes tend to think of the countryside as being full of tight-knit, mutually supportive communities, but if you got on the wrong side of them, then you could find yourself living in the loneliest place on earth, and there was no one who was ostracised more than the person who did my next worst job, who was the sin eater, and his job involved eating bread off a corpse. Because in the countryside, they believed in a mixture of religion and old style folk magic. And one of the things that they thought was that if someone died without their sins being forgiven, then they would go to hell. So if someone passed away without absolution, they would place some salt and some bread on the corpse which were supposed to absorb the sins and then the sin eater came along and in order to get rid of the sins completely he ate the salt and the bread so now all the sins were inside him and if he did it he got paid sixpence and a bowl full of beer. But the unfortunate thing was that now the local people shunned him because he was so riddled with sin, which seems pretty unfair because without him, this poor bloke would still be in purgatory. Of course, as the countryside moved into the modern era, the sin eater died out. But the jobs just got worse and worse. Until the 18th century, the only people who really knew their way round the countryside were the locals. But with the threat of invasion by the French, accurate maps became vital. The Defence Ministry, the Board of Ordnance, started a survey of the south of England. This Ordnance Survey employed highly trained surveyors and their luckless assistants. The worst job of pole men provided the legwork institution. Without the job of the pole man, we wouldn't have these fantastic things. Today, ordnance survey maps are part of the way we appreciate the countryside. Apart from anything else, they stop us useless townies from getting lost. But 
Imagine the longest, the worst day you've ever had traipsing through mud and stinging nettles and bushes and you'll just get an inkling of the horrible job of being a pole man. The first job was to get a basic idea of the layout of the land by triangulation. By taking two known points and sighting a third in relation to them, the survey covered the land with a honeycomb of readings. The pole man had to trudge every inch of the course. Francis, the hey. church is northeast, and that building over there is north northwest. Thanks very much. I'll drop that down here. What's that table? This is one of the, the several sorts of instruments that people could have used to fill in the details after they'd fixed the main triangulation points. Why was um, it such a bad job? I mean, all right, it wasn't that much fun schlepping up a hill and back again, but uh, people would just do that on a day out. Well, it might be lovely weather today, but it wouldn't be always like that. You would be out in the rain and the fog and even the snow if you were really unlucky. And if you're the surveyor's assistant, your surveyor is going to be sending you to all the nastiest bits where he doesn't want to go himself. And I bet I'm carrying all your stuff, aren't I? Absolutely. Nice heavy equipment and um, quite a lot of miles to travel. So what did the pole man do with his pole? The pole is for carrying to a, a far distant point where the surveyor can actually sight it and mark the bearing down on the map so that um, that point can then be fixed. So what do you want me to do? I'd like you to take a pole and go off to roughly where that telegraph pole is over there, please. <laughs> Mapping one field could mean miles of walking back and forth through thistles, mud and mire. And if you got the instructions wrong, it meant double the distance. It's further than it looks, actually. I couldn't tell what you were trying to show me with your signals. Ah, I w was trying to say go further up the hill to the next corner, um, but uh, now you've, you've uh, come back um, it's go further up the hill from to the next corner from here, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Sure. Eventually, surveyors came up with a signal system that worked until walkie-talkies. The next thing we need to have a go at is measuring on the ground with a chain because there are some places where you couldn't actually use a sighting pole. Originally people used rope, ropes with knots in at suitable intervals yeah. for measuring distances, but very often it rained and the ropes got wet and the length changed. What did the local people feel about all these surveyors traipsing up and down their land? Well, very often they didn't like it very much, as you could probably imagine. If it was the Ordnance Survey, they thought, what's the government up to, sending these military types round to tramp across our fields? Are they going to put the taxes up? Or if it was an ordinary landowner who was, was having his field surveyed, they, they all think, well, he's going to put the rents up for all the tenants and, and uh, make more money out of us. In Devon, the locals were so hostile, they stoned the surveyors. But it was the work itself that was the real downside, especially the chain. Even in 1771, a surveyor moans that it can't get an assistant to lead the chain over rough mountains for under a shilling a day. Right. All right, there's one. OK, and then drag it back along the same line. One chain is a cricket pitch, 22 yards. 80 make one mile. Even if this was the wrong sign, I wasn't telling Francis. I think this place is pretty well surveyed now. 
What do you think the very worst part of being a surveyor was? Well, perhaps the worst thing would be when you thought you'd got to the end and you thought you'd got a final result and somebody came along and raised some doubt or other and you had to go back and check something all over again. So I think really we need you to take that compass and go back up to the top of the hill and check the original readings. Are you serious? Well, as your boss, I think I should be serious. That's the pole man's job, well, I'm resigning. But although our ordnance survey maps rely on his work, our mental picture of the countryside of the past relies on a very different worst job. John Constable is the quintessential painter of the countryside. Today pictures like this can seem charged with chocolate box nostalgia, but in his day, Constable was seen as daringly new. What was so revolutionary was the clouds, which he painted with meteorological accuracy, and the white flecks he used to render the shifting flicker of light and weather on leaves. Contemporaries found this unique way of using white paint so startling that they contemptuously referred to it as Constable Snow. And this snow, as well as things like glazed pots and even makeup, required a lead-white paint maker prepared to dedicate himself to hours of painstaking and highly toxic work. What are we doing here? What is, what, this is a very, very old process. This is a, called the, the stack meat process. Ancient Romans, ancient Egyptians were doing it. This is corroding blue lead into white lead. So just to keep pulling it Just keep me. going. You don't have to pull, push away. From the push 17th away. century onwards, penniless women were bought at hiring fairs to make lead white on a large scale. Heavy sheet lead is rolled into coils so they can be corroded using a primitive chemistry. I was about to find out how primitive. And this is a bit hummy in here. A bit hummy. Oh, wow. You just get hit by this wall of ammonia. This was so, it, horse dung. This is horse dung corroding the lid. In the yeah. bottom of each of these pots is <laughs> vinegar. They yeah. used to use urine. So what's the chemical reaction that takes place? What's then? taking place here is that the lead is first of all being converted into lead acetate. Yeah. The lead acetate in the atmosphere here from the dung, which is giving off carbon dioxide, is then converted to lead carbonate, lead carbonate and lead hydroxide. Oh. And that is white lead. So what do we do now? We've got to fill the whole of this space here, the whole of it, everywhere here. With these we'll, little pots? And then we shut the doors and lock it up for six months. Oh, oh, good idea. Now, while I set these out, there's a shovel. Yeah. You'll find a heap of dung around the corner. Yeah. Find a barrow. Lots of dung, please. It's the worst job. It's shoveling horse dung. Off you go. stacked the dung didn't have the foggiest about the chemicals, but they did know how tough the job was. They had to build stacks up to 12 metres high. Then they'd carry trays of lead weighing 25 kilos up ladders amid the stench of ammonia from the tons of horse poo. It was disgusting, but it worked. If you've ever experienced the heat in the middle of a compost heap, that's what acts as the catalyst for the six-month chemistry experiment. Come on! It's only grass. Yes, it's grass, but processed via a horse's bottom and heaving with bacteria, causing all manner of stomach problems for the unsuspecting workers. You wouldn't like to borrow a pair of gloves? Now you say, would I like to borrow a pair of gloves? <laughs> <laughs> what happens next? Right, what we've got to do is pack that a bit firmly around there. Yeah. It's, the, the important thing is to keep these these pots have got to be clean. Yeah. So pull one of those out. Yeah. And then it goes in like that. You'd be easier to try try that one there. Okay. 
and pop the pot in and just check that there's nothing inside it and it is clean because you've got to keep the lead clean. Yep. Okay. So that into that will go the vinegar. Then we'll go this. The coil will sit above the vinegar like that. Yep. And then we leave that for six months. And what does it look like at the end of six months? I'll show you. Well, that's a bit different, isn't it? Yes, Tony. This is actually a simulation. Because if this were white lead, this would be a toxic substance. Toxic for the workers. Toxic for the workers. Toxic for you and me. Oh. And we're this not. Is why you've we given are, me these gloves? I'm giving you the gloves. Thank you. But we're not. If this were white lead, we're not properly protected. I understand. Yes. Right. So what a worker would be involved in is taking this out of here. And bear in mind, this is a woman, and this weighs that's nine kilos, one and a half stone. Yeah. You then have to lift this coil out, and. Unroll it. Can I have a go. Yes, do. Go on. Yep. Get it. Sort of get all the powder off. Yep. You normally, normally you'd be collecting this in a tray. Yeah. So I can see that all this dust is coming off it. Yes. And what you're would it, breathing. What would it do to us? Well, if you were a pregnant woman, this would have an effect on the developing nervous system. Could possibly cause abortion. Could lead to learning difficulties in young children. How did you know whether you'd ingested so much of this that you were putting your unborn child at risk? Well, in the 19th century, when people started to be concerned about health, in fact, they were concerned in the 18th century, in the French Revolution, they tried to do away with white lead altogether, but found that they couldn't. Inspectors used to go around the factories and ask all the workers to stand like divers with their arms out in front of them like that. And if a person couldn't raise his hands, it was called wrist drop. And he couldn't raise his hands because the signal from his brain to his fingertip tips was not constant. So he couldn't hold his hand up. It didn't always work. In 1872, a teenager called Charlotte Rafferty had worked for just five months at the lead white firm of Walkers, Parker and Co. before she collapsed and died. A bit more oil. The powder was mixed with oil to form a paste. Artists then further diluted this. But even with the minute quantities they used on their canvas, they drank milk to try and prevent absorbing the lead. So we've got our lead white paint, and I'm going to use this bit to paint a tiny little object that's transformed our countryside. The golf ball. The countryside has always been what we've made it. Today, more and more of it's used for leisure rather than survival. Golf started with Scots hitting stones down rabbit holes with sticks. Today, there are 2,485 golf courses in Britain, gobbling up a quarter of a million acres of countryside. But the game would never have spread without the invention of the first proper golf ball, the feathering. Made from bull's hide and boiled feathers by a craftsman with a worst job. Why worst? Just enter his workshop. Phil, Hello, we're going to make golf balls. We are. Hang on, I was about to say why on earth would that be a worst job, but I think I already know. The smells probably set, set you up for it. it. This is horrible. Whatever is this? Feathers and water. Feathers? That's yeah, great. No idea that boy. <laughs> Boiling feathers smelt quite so bad. So what is it we're making precisely? Ah, oh, we are making precisely an early form of golf ball. <laughs> known as a feathery, hence the feathers. It's not round, is it? No. It's like a, a Pixies rugby ball. You can see that little stitch all the way along there. It's very light. Yeah, that's the three pieces. The body. Featheries stopped being made in the 1850s. That's cheating. I'll let Phil's you recreated around. the feathery pattern from museum exhibits. The leathers sewn together before being turned inside out and stuffed with the stinking feathery gunk. Do that, don't give a chance to cool down a bit. Yeah. A For two effort. centuries, featheries were the only golf ball. Hundreds of craftsmen and apprentices did this mind numbing job amidst the stench of great vats of feathers. It is extraordinary, actually. You see how much feather there is left. We've got virtually that much feather into this. Until 1850, feathery makers made a good, if tedious and smelly, living. 
supply never met demand for their throwaway product. Cool. Cat fingers, stinky feathers, <laughs> flies buzzing round. How many of these do you reckon you'd make in a day? At the time they reckoned about three to five a day. And how many would you need for one round of golf? Uh, between seven and eight. So one bloke couldn't make in a day enough balls for some other chap to Actually, use for one round. That's correct. That's extraordinary. Round just a little bit. Yeah. Then put it in your hands and then just roll it around your hands to totally cover the ball. Yeah. Nice and slowly. That's rather nice. But in the mid-19th century, the invention of the latex gutter percha ball destroyed the feathery market, leaving hundreds of workers destitute. So, do these first featheries for 150 years actually work? Oh, wow! That really shifted, didn't it? That's excellent! If it wasn't for the advances of the feathery man, then blokes like Tony would still be driving stones down hills and putting them into rabbit holes. But it has to be said that sticking your face into a vat full of rancid, boiling feathers does make it a worse job. Although, at least your feet are dry and firmly on the ground, which is more than can be said for the very worst rural job of all. I've been looking at some of the worst jobs that have made our countryside what it is today. But which is the very worst? Ouch! It's a little bit fair! Keeping the nation in wool was tough, but at least the shepherds didn't risk ending up a state tatar like the threshing machine workers. And even the outcast Reddle man had a stable of monochrome living. No, for me, the very worst is a mind-numbingly terrifying job without which we wouldn't have one of the most important symbols of village life. It's the steeplejack. The countryside revolves round the communities who've made it what it is. For centuries, the spire of the village church has been the symbolic heart of rural life. But these stone beacons are fragile. They're literally tied together with iron. Without the steeplejack, these key features of the landscape would simply collapse. Here I am as a steeplejack. Actually, steeplejacks were really respected because they were skilled craftsmen and they earned quite a good wage as well. But frankly, any job which involves climbing about 60 metres up into the air and just clinging on to a bit of stone is my idea of hell. And when it got to the Victorian period, it was even worse because of the smog, which meant that all the ironwork got corroded and everything was covered in black gunk. Roger, I know today I'm going to have to put all this safety kit on, but yep. what kind of gear did they have to protect themselves in Victorian times? Um, in the Victorian times, they would have had absolutely nothing. They would have just had a straight ladder up the side of the church spire and you would have had to climb that and do your work when you got to the top. You would have had a bosun seat, which we're still using today, but there would have been no, no safety devices on that at all. Photos from one steeplejack firm showed just how perilous it was. Three men from this company had falls from more than 60 feet. Why did they go up there? To maintain the structure. Before we started installing lightning conductors um, onto these sort of structures to protect them, there was struck by lightning quite frequently with consequent damage to the masonry, the weather vanes, etc. So what do you want us to do today? We want you to go right to the very tip of the spire today to fetch the weathercock down. That's not been repaired for at least 50 years. So it's not just that I've got to go up there, I've got to go right up to the very top. And That's it. Pick yeah. out the largest, heaviest thing that hasn't been touched for 50 years. That's the one, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Wouldn't you know it, this isn't any old spire. St Mary's Bloxham has got the highest spire in Oxfordshire. Thanks. Oh, wow. A magnificent view. Mind you, looking down, it is a little bit scary. And this is what, halfway up? This is halfway up, yes. So a little breather here and then... Then uh, on up to the top of the spire. Right, up there. Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. I don't know if I can do this. I'll have a go. Yep. 
You'll be fine, Tony. How would they have got the fixings for the ladders? They would have driven a wedge into the wall, an iron wedge. Yeah. And uh, just tied the ladders to that. Uh, and then when they got to the top of one ladder, climb up to that and then rig another ladder on top of that. That's it, yeah. Tie the two lets of uh, ladder together. Um, I thought this letter was going to be at an angle. It's vertical. It's, uh, it's not actually vertical, Tony. It's uh, got the same angle as the spire. <laughs> you could have fooled me. My legs are shaking already and I haven't even got onto the, the first rung. But mm -hmm. can you imagine what it must have been like before you had all this stuff? All right, here we go. Oh. Now, what I know I mustn't do is look down. So, just keep up a regular rhythm, I think. And just not worry about anything at all. Oh. Hey, Rog? Yes, Tony? What did they do if they wanted a wee? Well, if you've ever been walking around in town on a nice, clear, sunny day, yeah. and you've felt a spot of moisture on your forehead, and that's a steeplejack. I'm glad you told me that. Parish records are littered with steeplejack fatalities from lightning strikes, collapsed scaffolding, and deadly falls. The luckiest or unluckiest Victorian steeplejack was a chap called Larkin. He survived three falls from height, only to be killed ironically by toppling just 15 feet. Hey, it's here! Hey, Roger, we're there. Yep, finally got to the top, Tony. I didn't think it would actually be golden. There's still a few little bits of gold left on it, but it's uh, pretty rough, that is, by our standards. I don't fancy standing up very much. Oof. It's wobbly with you on it, I tell you. Yeah, give a good firm grip of that, you'll be fine. Does it come off here? Yeah. Just... Is it going to be very heavy? It's got a bit of suction in it because, see, it's quite tight on the rod. Go on, how much higher does it go? There it goes. Uh, that's it. Wow, do you want to pass it down to me? Hang on. Yep. What's, what's that there? That's a, that's a bullet hole, Tony. That'll date from the um, Second World War. All right, chuck it down to me, mate. OK, Tony, are you ready for it? Yeah, here we go. That's what you came all the way up here for. Here we are. Job done. No, no, not quite, no. Oh, I forgot the ball. Oh. Cheers, mate. Ooh. Incredible feeling of satisfaction, although we've got to take this little lot back down the bottom again now. But if it hadn't been for the steeplejacks and the threshers and the nettle harvesters, then we wouldn't have the fantastic countryside that we've got today. And the same is true of our towns and our industry and our monarchy. It was the workforce who made the history of Britain happen.